All right, let's go ahead and open up to Romans. We're in Romans 13. We're going to look at this uh, armor of light. Uh, uh, with, and this will really finish off uh, Romans 13 for us. Uh, before we go there, though, I think one of the main things we've got out of Romans 13 is this whole idea of this transition period. We've talked a lot about uh, it a lot in our study of Romans. Uh, and I've had such an overwhelming response to this topic, I thought I'd start today uh, by looking at a couple other things. One of the emails I got was from someone who said, once you understand this transition period, it answers a lot of questions. And I wanted to show today how many questions it really answers. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the questions with all the answers, but I'm going to give you a, a taste. When you understand that this Acts period, uh, if you go to the far left of this diagram with a black edge of that triangle, that's the beginning of Acts. And it's all about Peter and the Twelve and God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. Of course, where you see the point of the green starting, that we're about Acts 7 to 9 in that area, uh, you have the stoning of Stephen, and Israel has rejected her king, her Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, once and for all. And God now sets aside Israel's prophetic program uh, and it begins diminishing and will be off the scene by the time you get to the end of Acts, Acts 28, uh, 25 through 28 or so. And that's the Acts period. Once they, at the stoning of Stephen, uh, who's there at the stoning of Stephen? Who, who orchestrates the stoning of Stephen? Remember, we're pointed to look at someone's feet. Not a very fun thing to think about, but he says, look at someone's feet. And whose feet were they? Saul, God's chief enemy, the enemy of Christ and his people at that time. And instead of coming down to destroy Saul, his enemy, he came down and saved Saul. And he raised up Saul, and now he's begun a new program. And he called, Paul calls it his God's mystery program for the body of Christ, and that starts increasing. And by the time you get to the end of that Acts period, and a couple years after that, that brings in the fullness of salvation. That day of salvation that Paul said at the, in his first missionary trip, way back in Acts 13, he said, God has raised me up to be a light to the Gentiles. Now remember that light, because what are we going to talk about today? The armor of light. So obviously he's talking about Pauline grace mystery truth. He was set up to be a light to the Gentiles and take salvation out to the ends of the earth. Uh, and that's where we were in Romans 13. We see that that's been, uh, uh, that program, what he's accomplished there, uh, has, been, has been nearly complete. And when we looked out at Colossians and Ephesians, it's completed. What he said at his first missionary journey, God sent me out to take salvation and light out to the Gentiles, out to the ends of the earth. If you read Colossians several times in the first chapter, he says, now that salvation has gone out to the whole earth. And by the time you get to this point, the only show in town is God's mystery program for the body of Christ. It was increasing. Now it's in the fullness of salvation. The full day of salvation is here. Israel's prophetic program has been completely shut down, packed in boxes, taped up, put in storage, locked in storage. And now this is the only show in town. It has been the only show in town for the last 2,000 years. And when you uh, understand that, so many things become much clearer. And that's what I was amazed at the response over the past couple of weeks with this, uh, with this transition period thing. So I thought I would just, just look at some of the things that we can understand when we have an idea what's going on in this, uh, this transition or acts period, it's called by some, this transition period. One thing we're going to, is important today, and you'll, I'll spend more time on it later and cover these other things first. During this transition period, it's important to see when Paul talks about knowledge, uh, he always uses the Greek word gnosis. In Romans, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Once you're out of the transition period, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and, the, and after that, pastoral epistles, it's always epinosis. 
He goes from partial knowledge to full knowledge. Now, when you understand that, 1 Corinthians 13, when he's talking about those revelatory gifts, and he's talking about prophecy, and those revelatory gifts are going to cease, what does he explain? He says, now, 1 Corinthians is a transition period book, now I see I have partial knowledge. But when full knowledge comes in, the things that belong to partial knowledge are going to disappear, those revelatory gifts, uh, p- uh, prophecy, and those other things he lists out there are going to fade away. And you have an explanation of why uh, those revelatory gifts have ceased. And you've got whole denominations, whole religious groups trying to recreate these revelatory gifts, and all they need to do is go to Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. The other one, one of a, I just got an email today uh, from someone very upset about our teaching here uh, because we don't water baptize. And so if you're wondering why we don't water baptize, it's perfectly clear when you get into this uh, transition period. Be, remember, during this transition period, God's two programs uh, are in effect. One's diminishing. Peter and the Twelves, their program's diminishing soon be completely shut down, and one's increasing. During this time, there's three baptisms, at least those associated, I guess, with salvation. Uh, There's three baptisms. There's two baptisms in Israel's prophetic program. That's water baptism, a man baptizing someone into water or with water, and the second baptism in God's prophetic program with Israel is Christ baptizing uh, believers with the Holy Spirit. That's what you read in early Acts, Peter and the Twelve, uh, as they put that out. But that's, there's a third baptism, and that's Paul's baptism. And that baptism, Paul says, the Holy Spirit is baptizing us into Christ. So you have a man in this program, you have two baptisms, a man baptizing another person, a believer, into water in, or with water, and the Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And this Paul reveals a baptism whereby it's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into Christ. Three different baptisms, three different mediators. Uh, one is a man with water, uh, one is, the, is Christ with the Holy Spirit. Those belong to Israel's prophetic program. And one is uh, the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ. Three different baptisms. Now, when you realize that this prophetic program is diminishing and will soon be completely shut down, what does it say about the two baptisms associated here? They're shut down. They're part of that program. And the only baptism left for today is the one Paul talks about, uh, the Holy Spirit baptizing believers into Christ. And that's why when you get to Ephesians, go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. That's why this transition period understanding is so important. It explains so many things. When you get to Ephesians 4, you're out. Ephesians is about the same time as Colossians. This transition period's over. God's completely packed away his program with the nation of Israel. It's locked away in storage. He won't start it out again until the end of the dispensation of grace, and he starts the night of prophecy again. And you get to Ephesians and Colossians now, and look what he says. Let's just start at verse 4. Or excuse me, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body, during the transition period, there's two bodies. There's the believing remnant of Israel and the, and the, for in God's prophetic program and the body of Christ in his mystery program. And one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and of course that's Pauline Grace Mystery Truth now, and one baptism. Now, I know most of historic Christianity just throws away that verse and says, no, there's, there's more than one baptism. There's still a water baptism, and, and then they mix up the, uh, the Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit of this program with the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ in this program. They say that's really the same thing. And so there's a water baptism and this other spiritual baptism. 
But Paul says, when you get to, Ephes uh, when you get to Ephesians, there's only one baptism. These two have been set aside with the nation of Israel, and the one that goes on is the one Paul talked about. And it's not Christ baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. That's what you read about Peter, with Peter and the Twelve of Pentecost. It's the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ. Romans 6, 1 Corinthians 12, that's the one that's left. So there you have why uh, water baptism, not only water baptism, but why uh, Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit is not baptisms uh, in effect today. One baptism, and that's the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ, into the body of Christ. This transition period explains that, and not only explains it, uh, but demands that, that conclusion. Understanding this transition period, uh, we under, it, it opens the door to understanding these sign gifts to Israel during this transition period. Remember, during this time, what was Paul doing? Uh, what was his first stop on those missionary journeys during the transition period? He was going to the Jews first. He went to the, into the synagogues. He went in his explanation, Romans 9 to 11, we've been over hopefully pretty thoroughly, uh, Romans 9 to 11, he says he did that so that he might save some of them out of the apostate nation of Israel before God had completely shut her down and bring them into his mystery program for the body of Christ. And he goes to the Jew first. And the Jews, going all the way back to Exodus 3 and 4, at the Exodus account, what did God always promise the Jews, the Israelites? He would always accompany his message with signs. And so Paul, during this transition period, Peter and the Twelve and Paul exhibited the signs to Israel to minister to her during this transition period. Once this transition period is over, God is all done with the nation of Israel temporarily. Uh, he's packed her away, put her in storage, won't bring her out again till the end of the dispensation of grace. Uh, and he, the nation of Israel now is packed away, so then there's no reason for the signs to Israel. God's not dealing with the nation of Israel. So this transition period explains why the, why the revelatory gifts have been set aside because uh, they were only effective when they have partial knowledge instead of full knowledge. And it explains why the sign gifts to Israel have been set aside. Speaking in tongues and handling snakes and all that kind of stuff uh, have been set aside because God's not dealing with the nation of Israel anymore, so he doesn't need to give them signs. The transition period answers all these questions. Uh, and I thought of another one on the way here, this morning, Gospels. Uh, how much of historic Christianity says there's just one Gospel? It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, uh, and there's one Gospel. But there's not. And during this transition period, depending on how you divide them out, uh, there's at least two Gospels. Uh, and possibly, by the time you get near further the end, uh, of the transition period, three, depending on how you count, the Peter and the Twelve proclaimed were associated with the gospel of the kingdom. Once that kingdom, once Paul came in Acts 15, somewhere in here, he explained to them, God's put the kingdom in abeyance. God set aside his program with the nation of Israel. So now, when in Galatians, when he refers to their gospel, he calls it the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the Jews. So during this time, you have the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of circumcision. I put those together uh, as the same gospel. It's just they're both the gospel of the kingdom, just one. Uh, the kingdom is a real potentiality early in Acts, uh, and later it's an abeyance. But there's also Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace. So you have more than one gospel, and you see that in uh, Galatians. Now, when you understand that, then the book of Galatians is going to open up because when you go to Galatians 1 and he puts a curse on anyone that goes to another gospel, what does most of people explain that passage? What do the, the cults all use that? They say he's talking about a false gospel. Well, in 2 Corinthians 11, 10 and 11, 
Paul talks a lot about false prophets, false teachers, false ministers. And you know what? Paul has a perfectly good word when he wants to describe something as false. He has no problem using the word false. He doesn't use that in Galatians. He doesn't say it's a false gospel. He says they were going to another gospel. Galatians is written in this transition period. Here you have the gospel uh, of Peter and the 12 and the gospel of John, I guess you could say. And here you have Paul's gospel. The problem in Galatians wasn't that they were becoming a cult going to some false gospel. The problem in Galatians is they were going back to Peter and John's gospel. They were confusing these gospels. Now, once that transition period is done, that gospel is completely shut down. Paul's gospel now, Romans 16, 25, what everyone should have memorized inside out and backwards. Now what establishes, what sets up, what perfects uh, members of the body of Christ and the body of Christ as a, whole, as a whole is Paul's gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which had been kept secret since the world began. All this is explained in the transition period. Uh, and it opens up your Bibles, uh, if you appreciate this. Uh, and one of the other things we're going to look at now is this armor of light. So let's go over to Romans. Romans 13, and we'll pick it up with the armor of light. We're going to end up over in Ephesians 6. Verse uh, 11, we've been over verse 11. If I start back in verse 11, uh, we'll probably be here for an, an extra hour. So let's just begin it up at verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. We talked about that, the transition period, the day of salva Pauline salvation is almost in full view, uh, and the night of Israel's prophetic program is far spent and would soon be shut down. Let us, not, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Uh, let us put on the armor of light. And so that's what we want to look at today. This whole uh, armor of light was not delineated in full until Ephesians and Colossians. This all plays into that transition period concept uh, there. Once the transition period is over, uh, and we tra we, I think we just ended the last week uh, by looking at this. We won't turn to all the passages, but if we remember our chart here, we, had, we looked at three sister passages uh, for verses Romans 13, 11 to 14. Uh, that was that passage, uh, for, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 to 8, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. They all involved, had something about a day, they had something about salvation, they had something about a night, and they all had something about armor, the armor of God. In 1 Thessalonians, which is written uh, here, near uh, the, probably a little past the midpoint of that transition period, he doesn't talk about the armor of God. He just gives two pieces of the armor. The breastplate of righteous, or excuse me, the breastplate of faith and love, and he gives the helmet of the hope of salvation. That's what they had available in 1 Thessalonians at this time. By the time you get to Romans and, for, and uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, uh, you now, several years have gone by, some think anywhere five to ten years later. Now you have the armor of God. That's what we just read in Romans 13. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians 6, it's called the armor of righteousness. So now you have the armor of God, but it's just in general terms uh, of the light and of righteousness. But now let's go to Ephesians 6. Now go to Ephesians 6, and we're going to see uh, that it's now... It's changed, it's progressed, I guess you could say, uh, as this ch change, is in, uh, change has been occurring. As this, Paul's light going out to the world and salvation going out to the world has been increasing, we go from two parts of the armor to the armor in general terms, light and righteousness, and now in Colossians, with a full revelation of Pauline grace mystery truth, now you have, look at verse 11. Put on, this is Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, in Ephesians, Colossians, after that transition period, when Paul's 
gospel has complete, and salvation has gone out completely to the world. Now he says they can put on the whole armor of God. And that's what we want to look at today. And if you think, well, I'm making a lot out of one instance, go down to verse 13. Verse 13, he's going to say the same thing again. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So he didn't tell that to the Thessalonians, and he didn't really even tell that to the Corinthians or the Romans. But now, with the Ephesians, now that Paul's uh, Pauline grace mystery truth has full, been fully revealed, fully recorded in the scriptures, fully sent out to the world, Colossians 1 and 2, Ephesians 1 to 3, now that that's happened, now they can put on the whole armor of God. It's all part of this transition period. Now they're out of the transition period, now they have the whole armor. And uh, it's uh, important, I think, to see what the context is uh, in here. So let's go back up to verse 10, Ephesians 6, verse 10. First of all, uh, let's note the larger context. context. Uh, this is one of those famous passages of scripture uh, that everyone goes to, but you know what they don't do? They don't read what came before and what came after. They name the, grab onto these verses and just kind of make them mean whatever they want them to mean. But I just want to point out what Paul, and therefore what God, meant them to mean. And the important thing in the general context of this, this does, these verses don't just drop out of a promise box somewhere and into someone's lap without any context. There's been something going on here in Ephesians. So what is the context? We're not going to set up the whole book, but we need to at least take note in Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, what is the context? What, why do we put on the armor of God? What is its purpose? What's supposed to be the end result? Is it just to satisfy our own selfish desires, get, what, get God to do what we want? Uh, or is there something else involved? And the larger context of Ephesians, and we're just going to pick it up here in chapter 3, for this cause, verse 1, for this cause I, Paul, in contrast to all others, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, that's what we're in now, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Well, now there you have it. Uh, you can either accept it or reject it. God, say, or God and Paul, because God is ultimately the writer of Ephesians, God and Paul say that uh, God gave Paul, the stewardship of the dispensation of grace, and he revealed its doctrinal concept, the Pauline grace mystery truth, to Paul through a direct revelation. No one gave it. Galatians, he makes that point. I didn't get it from any men. I didn't get it from Peter and the Twelve. I didn't get it from anybody. Here you have the positive side to that. I got it as a direct revelation from God. If you want, and so now the question is, well, okay, if it's a direct revelation from God and it was given to Paul, how are the rest of us going to know anything about it? And he tell, goes, you, goes through it step by step. How that by revelation, verse 3, he made known unto me the mystery. Uh, so to Paul, it was a direct revelation. How does everyone else get it? As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So now you know exactly how it works. Nobody knew anything about the mystery before Paul. God revealed it directly to Paul. Paul wrote it down in the scriptures, and we read it. And then we know what Paul knew about the mystery. And the, the Holy Spirit takes what Paul wrote, and they read the next step. And notice he interjects something here, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. Uh, now you, I read every commentary, uh, even those with an Acts 2 uh, position, they come along and say they, that other apostles did know. And Paul says that nobody else knew. Well, who are you going to believe? Uh, commentators, or are you going to believe God and Paul? Paul says no one else knew. It came to him by direct revelation. No one else knew it. It wasn't known to the sons of men. And the only reason anyone else can know it is because Paul wrote it down, and now we can read it. And the Holy Spirit takes that, the last half of verse 5, 
and is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And if we went over to chapter 4, we'd see exactly what he meant by the apostles and prophets. Uh, he's talking about those secondary apostles and prophets, gifts to the church during this, or their formative years. Uh, those are his co-workers, the ones he sends out, the ones he works through, his co-workers. And the Holy Spirit now makes them uh, known to them. So that's the way it works. Uh, and so it's in the context of this mystery program. Direct revelation to Paul. Paul wrote it in the scriptures. We've been calling it Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. We read it. The Holy Spirit takes it and teaches it to us. And that's what, what our ministry is today. Whereof, I was, well, I guess let's just, just speed it up here. Let's just see what is the intent What's the purpose of this mystery? To the intent, verse 10, that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church, that's the church, the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There was a purpose, an eternal purpose, a purpose God came up with in eternity past, put it, wrote it down on a piece of paper, put it in the deepest vault of heaven, locked it away, hid it away, and he didn't bring it out again until he raised up Paul. Then he revealed it directly to Paul, through the Holy Spirit, he put it in the scriptures, we read it, and now the Holy Spirit teaches us what God's doing today through that. And that's the context here. It's all in the context of the mystery. Now let's see how when we get to the end of our passage, go now to chapter 6 again. In light of this mystery program, uh, and uh, remember when we see the progression going from Romans to Ephesians, Romans answers, in Romans, Paul and God tell us he's begun, he's created a new group of people called the body of Christ. All right? That, asks, that generates a question. Well, why do you need a new group of people, Paul? And Paul answers that in Romans. He says, I needed a new group of people, the body of Christ, because I have a new program, a mystery program. And that and generates another question. Well, Paul, okay, I got why you need a new group of people, but why did you need a new program? And Romans doesn't answer that question. Ephesians answers that question. And Ephesians says that I needed a new program because I have a new purpose. I'm going to not only use the redeemed humanity, the nation of Israel, to reestablish my glory on earth, Anyone could guess that. Uh, men belong on earth. People belong on Humans belong on earth. Of course they're going to, if he's going to re reestablish his glory on earth, he's going to use humanity, obviously. No brainer. But he had a secret purpose. He's also going to use a redeemed humanity to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. And you see, that's something no one would guess. No angel would guess it. No one would guess it. Men don't belong in the heavenlies, ruling in the heavens. They belong on earth. And nobody guessed it. Nobody knew about it until he revealed it to Paul. And now Paul's mission is to make it known throughout the whole world. And so now, what's the purpose in that context? How does our passage end? You can't, it's like Romans 4. You know, everybody loves that, those verses, be anxious for nothing, pray without ceasing, and all that. But you see, you really can't, you can't stop reading at those two verses. You've got to go all the way down to chapter 4, verse 9, and you'll see exactly what you're supposed to be thinking about, praying about, working toward, involved with. Because in chapter 9, he says, it's all those things that you have heard and seen and read of mine. And it's the same thing here in Ephesians. You can't just take out these verses and just make them mean whatever you want them to mean. He's going to tell you exactly how to apply, why, why the armor of God is so important. Go over to verse 19. He's going to give himself as the example. Why do we need the armor of God? Why does Paul need the armor of God? Verse 19, and for me, Paul, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's the purpose of the armor of God. If you think you're using the armor of God with, without this purpose, 
then you're not. It's as simple as that. The purpose of the armor of God is to protect us so that we can participate in a ministry whereby we can boldly proclaim and keep on boldly proclaiming Pauline grace mystery truth. That's the purpose of the armor. It's not to make you feel better. It's not to solve all your problems. It's not to get God to do whatever you want him to do. It's so that we can be prepared to boldly proclaim the gospel, of, the mystery of the gospel, Pauline grace, mystery, truth. And when you realize that, now when we go back to these actual verses, you'll understand why everything is about God's truth for today. He mentions truth. He mentions the faith. He mentions the word of God. All in two or three, three or four little verses here. That's what the armor of God is for. It's for uh, the protection of us so that we can go and we can proclaim God's word, Pauline Grace Mystery Truth for today, boldly. Because there's going to be a lot of attacks. There's going to be a lot of calls to compromise the message. Well, you're such a little assembly, that, so you must not be right. Uh, you don't have many other people in the world that say the same things you say. Well, that's certainly right. You don't say what the ancient father said. Well, that's certainly right. And we're going to have to have this armor on if we're going to keep on boldly proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. Pauline grace in the context of the mystery. That's what these verses are about. Don't reduce them to some individual personal uh, uh, way to get God to do what you want. That's not what this is about. This is about an assembly working together and keeping this armor in place so that we can pro boldly proclaim Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. So now with that in mind, let's see where it begins and ends. Now let's go to the narrower context. Putting on the armor of God begins with standing fast in the Lord. Look at that in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Remember back in Romans 13, uh, that, was that last word, it says, don't go back to the flesh for anything. Don't rely on the flesh for anything. The flesh, when we operate through the flesh, we're operating based on our own power. And you're going to find out our own power is woefully insufficient to do the work of boldly proclaiming the mystery. Woefully insufficient. We have to rest in the power of God, and we're not going to develop today, but that was all part of Ephesians 1 to 4 as well, 1 to 5 as well. Uh, but look, he says it again uh, in or that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. So you have that standing in the Lord, standing uh, in, in spite of the fact it's an evil day and having done all to stand. So it begins with standing in the Lord, and that can't be done through the power of the flesh because we don't have enough power in our flesh. Uh, it has to be done through the power of the Lord, the power of God. And it ends with unceasing prayer and supplications. Verse 18, praying always uh, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. It begins with standing in the Lord and it ends with prayer, unceasing prayer in the spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And I just, I don't, I might have to turn a page here. I'm not going to, but remember the very next word. Uh, he says that I might speak boldly the mystery. You can't forget. Don't let verse 19, even if like in my Bible, it's on the next page over. Don't forget verse 19. Don't just pick the verses you want. This is all leading to the, give the effect, the end result, that Paul and everyone associated with him and all the assemblies he created uh, will boldly proclaim, will withstand the wiles of the devils to get them to compromise, go to some other message, go to, an, like the Galatians, uh, he comp they, he, well, let's get them to go to the Peter's gospel. John's gospel, the Twelve's gospel, the gospel of the kingdom and the circumcision, we'll get them to go back to that. 
And then that brings them back under the law. And then they'll be all messed up. And Paul writes a whole book called the Book of Galatians that says you're under a curse. Don't bring that gospel into our gospel. It brings a curse upon them. The armor of light is Pauline grace, mystery, truth, uh, the source of God's light to the world uh, and Gentiles today. Uh, that should be a key verse for you when it comes to the transition period. We've looked at it a bunch of times over the past couple of weeks, so we won't turn there. But Acts 13, 47, that's a key verse because it's, he says it at the beginning of his first missionary journey. God has commissioned me to be a light to the Gentiles and to take salvation out to the ends of the world. And in that account, Pisidia, Antioch, what had just happened? The synagogue, most of the Jews had rejected him. So you know what that means? He's taking, the, he, this is, see, if you're all stand, sitting here, uh, sitting in your chair after I say this, uh, then either you know it pretty well already or uh, you're just not getting it. Because everything else God has ever revealed is his salvation and light going out to the uh, ends of the earth with Israel and through her rise. That's what Peter and the Twelve were trying to accomplish. That's why Peter and Twelve couldn't go out to the Gentiles. Not because they were bigoted, prejudiced Jews, and so God had to raise up Paul to go do what they refused to do. They couldn't go out in this program. They couldn't go out because first Jerusalem had to receive Christ. And then when Jerusalem, the leaders of Israel, received Christ, then they'd go to Judea, and Judea would receive Christ. And then when Jerusalem and Judea received Christ, they'd go to Samaria, and Samaria would receive Christ. All Israel would be saved. Then God would raise her up and send her out to the Gentiles, light and salvation to the Gentiles. But at the very beginning, Acts 7, what happened? Jerusalem rejected their Messiah once and for all and said, we will not have this man rule over us. And Peter and the Twelve's program shut down. It's like throwing a monkey wrench in a printing press. It just <laughs> shut it down and it's just slowly disappearing. Raised up Paul. And Paul now, you see, if this doesn't shock you, you're not getting it. Paul is being sent out to take God's light and salvation to the ends of the earth, to the Gentiles, apart from Israel, and through her fall. Different program, different purpose, different people. And what began at the point there was just a little flickering light. By the time you get here to Colossians, it's as bright as the noonday sun in its fullness. That's what this armor is about. Uh, and that's what he's taking out to the Gentiles here. The whole armor of God is based on um, my initials here. Uh, I love now when I get emails and people sign it off PGMT. But Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, if you don't know what that is, uh, which consists of two major doctrinal categories. So now we want to look at this armor uh, in chapter 6. The whole armor of God is based on Pauline grace, mystery, truth. Uh, we saw that. We, this the whole context of the book of Ephesians, the full salvation, full revelation of that mystery truth uh, by the addition of the, per, the heavenly purpose. It's made up of two groups of armor, two sets of three pieces of armor. Romans truth is especially uh, have to do with the revelation of the righteousness of God, fullness of faith and love. Ephesians truth is especially the fullness of salvation and that heavenly hope. And we talked about that earlier. The one thing Romans doesn't explain is why God needed a new program. And Ephesians said God needed a new program because he had a new purpose, a heavenly purpose. And now when you put these two things together, when you put together Romans and, the, the, and Ephesians and you put them together, you have the foundation document of all true Christianity. All those other things that were in pieces, what, what Romans and Ephesians does takes 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, all the work, work that his co-workers did, all the work that he did in his missionary journals verbally, and he takes all that stuff and he starts picking up all the pieces and he puts them in that puzzle. He puts them all in order 
and he puts them all in the right uh, categories, in the right positions, and by the time you get to Ephesians, the picture is full. The picture is complete. It's the whole uh, armor of God. And so let's read the Go to verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. The, this is Ephesians 6, verse 13. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So now we begin to, to look at each of these things. Uh, and it's going to become clear. He's going to it, break it down into three categories. Uh, the first one is loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, I would suggest that is all the basic fundamentals of Romans truth. Verse 16, uh, and above all, taking the shield of faith. And actually, our, this is another instance where our our English versions uh, keep something from us because in verse 16, the word the comes before faith. It's not just faith. It doesn't say you just believe whatever you want to believe and then it'll be the, the, uh, the armor of God put, holding up the shield of faith. That's the faith. It's Pauline grace mystery truth. And he says, hold the shield of the faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So you have the, uh, the faith in its fullness now. You have the salvation, the fullness of salvation is what Ephesians is really about. Uh, and you have the word of God used as a sword. Uh, and so you got the whole armor of God with that. This is the only truth that can enable us to stand firm in God's good plan for today, uh, withstanding the deceptions of the devil in the present evil day. We've done a lot of work with that in Romans 12 to 16. Uh, he promises them once they receive Romans, and this is Ro the end of Romans 16, the end of the book of Romans, he says God is going to use this epistle and eventually the book of Ephesians, to trample Satan under your feet. Pauline grace mystery truth. That's what God uses to trample Satan under the feet. And once they had Romans, a God would start doing that, and once they have Ephesians, they'll be able to put on the full armor of God and completely deflect all the attacks of Satan. God's playbook of the Pauline grace mystery truth is the only truth that can do this because our battle is in the spiritual realm and it tries to get us to play to some other playbook. Uh, God's play, and the key one there is God's playbook with the nation of Israel. See, this is the most deceptive thing. Don't, don't think of uh, this, say, I talk about Satan. He, he's not trying to enjoy you and make your head whirl around on your neck or anything like that. You can get all that out of your mind. This is Satan working, and what, here's his primary means of deception. Here's his means of deception. The primary means of deception, he's going to try to get the person to operate on the corridor of God's plan here instead of God's plan here. He's going to try and get, if you're an unsaved person, you know what he's going to try and do? He's going to try and make you think that you need to join a religious system that looks like the nation of Israel uh, with priests and rites and rituals and, and smoke and mirrors and all this kind of stuff, and that will make you good enough for God. And if he can't keep you from getting saved, if you hear Paul's gospel and you believe it and you're justified unto eternal life, you know what Satan's going to do? He's going to try, well, I can't keep them from getting saved, but I can have them spend the rest of their life down here on earth in vanity. I can, have, I can set them up so here they are in, in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, and they should be boldly proclaiming the mystery of the gospel, and instead I can have them try to spend all their time recreating Pentecost and the sign gifts there. Or I can spend, have them spend all their time following in the steps of Jesus in his earthly ministry. That's satanic deception. All that other spooky stuff get out of your mind. The way Satan works is he's trying to get people away from God's playbook for today. 
and to operate according to some other playbook. And the most deceptive other playbook of all is God's other playbook with the nation of Israel in this prophetic program. It'll keep people from getting saved and bringing them into some big religious system. That's most of historic Christianity. It's a big uh, apostate Christianity, unbelieving with their rituals in the East and the West and all that. Or if they, he can't keep you from getting saved, he'll get you so confused during your life down here, you won't be uh, a fruitful servant of the Lord. Because when you get on the whole armor of God, you're boldly proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. That's the purpose of it. So if you, don't, if you reject the mystery of the gospel, if you reject Pauline grace mystery truth, if you throw away Paul's apostleship and his distinct apostleship, if you throw away that, if you think he's just continuing what, that, what was going on in that program, you can pretend you have the armor of God all you want, but it's not the armor of God. It's just some other religious thing, some other theological thing. This is what is, the armor of God is supposed to protect us, Paul says, so that we can boldly proclaim Pauline grace mystery truth. That's the purpose of it. And now let's go look at anything else is going to throw us off course. Let's go back to our notes. Another important thing to realize here is verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, here's a very important, usually it's just kind of passed over, but it's uh, an important thing because what are we supposed, here gives the negative. We're not battling against flesh and blood. So I always like to ask the questions, well, what are we doing with flesh and blood? What's our purpose for flesh and blood? Well, flesh and blood is humanity, right? Uh, and what's the state of the earth? Sinners, ungodly sinners on enemy status before God. What's the state of the wor world? He calls it the evil world, uh, the evil system in which, the evil day in which we're, we're in. Flesh and blood. We're not supposed to be battling flesh and blood. What are we supposed to do? We, we have a ministry to flesh and blood. We're not battling them. We're ministering reconciliation to them. We're proclaiming to God's enemies, to the rebellious, to the idol worshipers, to all the uh, fallen humanity. We're not out battling them, judging them, and condemning them. We're supposed to be out there proclaiming the message of reconciliation to them. God, in Christ, on that cross, reconciled the world to himself. It's big enough for the whole world. Our job is to go out and say, be ye reconciled. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. Be reconciled. We're not battling. We're, we're not trying to harm, hurt, or get rid of God's enemies. We're trying to save God's enemies. We're not battling flesh and blood. Uh, our ministry is of reconciliation, peace, uh, dispensing the riches of his grace and mercy, dispensing the riches of his long-suffering kindness and goodness, all things Paul talks about. So where is our battle? We don't battle flesh and blood, uh, God's human enemies on earth. We're supposed to be offering them salvation, proclaiming reconciliation as revealed in Pauline grace, mystery, truth. And I guess I didn't put the verse here, but first, or 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, we pre operating in accord with what God is doing today. We do not bring vengeance, wrath, and judgment on God's enemies. We preach Paul's gospel to them that they might be saved. That's the whole point of this day of salvation. God, has, at the very moment God should have come and destroyed his enemies, beginning with Saul, going on to the house of Israel, and especially the Gentiles, God instead held back his wrath and judgment, came back and saved his worst enemy, Saul, made him our apostle Paul, and sent him with grace and peace to the Jews first, and then especially the Gentiles. It's a different program. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We don't battle against the flesh and blood. We minister to them. We proclaim salvation to them. We uh, proclaim reconciliation to them. Uh, operating in accord today, we don't destroy God's enemies. We don't attack them. We proclaim God's salvation to them. Satan's attacks 
uh, to steer us away from this ministry of reconciliation uh, to God's enemies. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants us to not do that. And if you confuse the two programs, uh, that is what the result is going to be. Uh, is going to be. Uh, so that's why, and you can just look at the Crusades. Uh, I'm not much of a historian, but those Crusades, what do they say? We're going to beat up all of God's enemies. We're going to reclaim Israel. See what satanic deception can do? They were trying to recreate a program that wasn't even in place. God's not even dealing with the nation of Israel today. They're out there trying to reclaim the nation of Israel for God and destroying all his enemies. And they didn't know anything about Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. That's not our job now. Our job is to go out with the ministry of reconciliation, with the ministry of grace and peace. That's what God's announcing to the world through Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. He's dispensing the riches of his mercy and grace and love and peace and goodness and kindness and forbearance and long suffering and salvation and glory. We don't battle flesh and blood, we minister to them. We battle against the wiles of the devil. And his primary attack, we already saw, uh, was by getting us to confuse his two programs. That's the primary, that's what makes it so deceptive. Because it's an actual another program of God's. It's an actual set of instructions from God. And so if you can go back to that, then you can say you're spiritual, uh, I'm uh, biblical, I'm scriptural. Look, it's all right there. But it's not what God's doing today. And it's going to bring in all kinds of confusion. The wiles of the devil are to deceive us to operate apart from God and his good plan for today is revealed in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth uh, and deceptively attacks us, especially to get us to play according to Israel's prophetic program. Because if we're playing in accord with Israel's prophetic program, I can guarantee you one thing as a finite human. We're not playing according to God's mystery program. You can't have both. Uh, you, as finite humans, you're either doing the one or the other. And if you're participating in this, then you're automatically leaving behind that. That's why it's so important to Paul when he drives that home. Standing fast in the Lord, praying without ceasing in the spirit, putting on the full, the whole armor of God, protects us from this getting mad, vengeance, attacking God's enemies, strengthening us to proclaim boldly the riches of grace as revealed in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. Uh, and Satan's attacks, oops, Satan's attacks, uh, I, we've, I think we've probably covered that enough, getting believers uh, to uh, follow another playbook, another way he attacks, and this is probably one of the key ones, uh, is by getting us to despair. We're out there, we might be the only ones saying this. Everybody else is throwing it away. No one else thinks this way. No one else teaches this. I hear that all the time. How come you're the only one teaching this? Well, I don't know. I'm just teaching what the God's word says. And so you're out there, you, and you can get, that's another way Satan deceives. Satan attacks. Uh, by calling into question the ministry, calling into question the minister. <laughs> well, all you got to do is look at me, and that don't take much work. Uh, and calling into question and bringing about despair and discouragement, uh, and that ends up, what happens when you're despairing and discouraging? What do you usually do? You usually go in the room and shut the door, right? You get silenced. That's what Paul's saying at the end of this passage. I pray, pray for me that I'll have the whole armor of God on so I'm not silenced. I don't despair. I'm not thrown off course. I don't play by another playbook. Uh, I don't lose, lose hope or to get discouraged, but I keep speaking boldly the mystery of the gospel. That's the point of this armor. That's the, and that's the main t attack he makes here, uh, can probably be summarized best by saying he tries to get us to operate by sight instead of by faith. That's the biggest, and that's basically what he says in Romans, don't operate by the flesh, operate by the spirit, don't operate by sight, operate by, by uh, faith. If you're carrying out a ministry 
under adverse circumstances, on evil t uh, ground, in an evil day, under difficult times, where attacks are coming all the time, where you're uh, pretty much all alone. Uh, that's why it's important to have an assembly of like-minded believers, Paul says. And if you're doing that, and you're participating in that, it's so easy to get discouraged. It's so easy to lose confidence, to be silenced. And that's because you're looking by sight. You're looking, oh, there's nobody here. Uh, there's nobody listening anywhere. I'm just going to go in my room and shut down. It's so easy to get discouraged. And we got to keep, that's why he put this armor on, the armor of truth, the armor of the faith, the armor of God's word. And to deflect those wiles of the devil, to bring, dis to bring either confusion by confusing God's two programs, throwing you off course, or by bringing about discouragement and defeat. That all comes from living by sight according to the flesh instead of living by faith according to the spirit. That's why he begins with standing in the Lord in the might of his power, and he ends with praying unceasingly in the spirit and I'm not going to let you forget what, ha what the very next phrase is so that you boldly proclaim the mystery that's the purpose of it and so we'll just kind of wrap up here prepare we'll finish it off next week I guess as uh, Romans 11 to 4, 13 11 to 14 is the capstone summary of Romans truth, Ephesians 10 to 20 is the capstone summary of all Pauline grace mystery truth. He's going to join together now, we kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, Romans truth and Ephesians truth. He's going to take those two. He's going to give three pieces of armor that are particularly relevant to Romans truth. He's going to take three pieces of armor that are particularly relevant to Ephesians truth. He's going to put them together, and he's going to say that's the whole armor of God. God's body of truth for today. And it all starts with believers wrapping themselves up. Verse uh, 14. Uh, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth. I, I guess, you know, I, I, I didn't know, know much about soldiers or war fighting in ancient times, but I guess they'd have like skirts and things like that, clothing that would hang down, and they would use something to tie back the skirts, tie up the pants, whatever, so there's nothing in the way nothing that would cause them to stumble, nothing that would hinder their movement. Uh, and here, what we do that with is truth. Pauline grace mystery truth that he's just been talking about in the first five chapters of Ephesians. And not to mention the book of Romans. His feet shod with the, uh, standing, have your loins girt with truth. Uh, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, if there's one word, here's one thing, I usually say how, where I differ from the com most commentators, but here's one thing I think every commentator would answer this the same way. No matter what theological, what religious system, if you ask them, uh, what's the primary message of Romans, they would all say, the righteousness of God. That's probably one thing everyone would agree on. That's the main topic of the book of Romans. Uh, and he's, that's the forms the breastplate. And we'll look at that, uh, why that's important. And then he's going to go to the, the, the importance of that breastplate of righteousness. Uh, and I'll just end with this, just to kind of set it up for next week when we'll put it all together. Uh, here's another way, the a while of the devil. Because that righteousness that Paul talks about is not the same righteousness of God that Peter and the Twelve talked about. Peter and the Twelve and all the non-Pauline scriptures, they talk about the righteousness of God in saving his friends and destroying his enemies. You read anywhere. That's what Peter expected in chapter 3, chapters 2 and 3 of Acts. That's what they're talking about in Sermon on the Mount and all those other things. That's what the psalmist talked about, David, the prophets. They all talk about God, please display your righteousness in saving your friends and destroying your enemies. And that's going to reach its culmination at the end of that tribulation period. But here's the point. That's not 
the righteousness of, the God, or of God that Paul talks about, Romans 3.21, really Romans 3 to chapter 5. For Paul, what God's manifesting today through Paul is the righteousness of God in, in saving his enemies because he has no friends. It's a different righteousness of God. And if you think you're part of the program that's displaying the righteousness of God by uh, saving his friends and destroying his enemies, then you're not going to be able to have the next piece of armor. Go to verse 15, and we'll end with this. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If you think your job is to destroy God's enemies, attack God's enemies, then you're not going to pick out the right shoes to wear. You're going to, instead of becoming shod with the shoes of peace, you're going to have them shod with the shoes of war. You're not going to be able to put on the, you're not going to pick the right shoes. You have to know what Romans said about what righteousness of God, God is manifesting today, and it's his righteousness now through the cross work of Christ, whereby he is saving his enemies because he has no friends. And if you have that in place from Romans truth, then you'll automatically, you'll hop out of bed and pick the right shoes. They're the shoes of peace, the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what we're going to offer. That's our ministry to God's enemies now. And we'll look at the second half of uh, Ephesians truth from there. So we'll close with that. Heavenly Father.